<laughs> Thanks. Lisa's not here because, as you can imagine, with a seven-month-old, a two-year-old, and a five-year-old for a week, <laughs> you know, she's... she's. <laughs> yeah, you, you can imagine. So the, the British invasion is returning to Manchester tomorrow, so we'll... We'll be sad that they're going, but you know, a few days rest will be nice, and then she'll be back. So we we thank God for their, for all three of our grandsons and our kids, and we've had a great week. I hope you've had a good time with your family too. Um, we're in uh, the third of or the fourth of five lessons talking about witness. And today I want to bring us to the widow of Zarephath. Um, who can tell us about this uh, story that Jesus felt was important enough that he brought it up in his inaugural recorded sermon? And for the three Jimmies, inaugural means the first <laughs> sermon. Okay, so it was important enough. Why would he bring up this obscure story, 1 Kings 17, the widow of Zarephath. Uh, where is Zarephath, by the way? Where, where is it, even? Remember, he brought up the healing of Naaman, which was not a Jewish person, right? Naaman is a Syrian, an Aramean. He brought that up. He brings up the widow of, of Zarephath, who's Elijah's healing. Naaman was Elisha's healing uh, story. Why would he do that? And what was he trying to convey to his hometown folks? Uh, okay, that, that the good news, the good news is available to all. No doubt he wanted to send that, that message. You know, it made him mad. Made him mad. It would be like Bill Urey coming home, right, to Madison and saying, uh, I would do some miracles here, but you people here in, in Hines and Madison County and Rankin County, you people just don't get it. And therefore, I've had to go to Carolina. <laughs> Zarephath, Carolina, to do these miracles. So Zarephath, is a town. Has anybody found it? Anybody Googled it? Zarephath. <laughs> First Kings 17. Okay. It's on the Mediterranean. It's in the region of Sidon and Tyre. So when you hear Sidonia, Sidonians, that's where we're talking about. And that area is a non-Jewish area. It's a Gentile area. And the Sidonians had particularly, particularly heinous religious practices. Of course, they had all the sexuality stuff going on. Plus, they killed their children. They sacrificed their children. So it was so heinous that they actually went to that extreme. So let's go, and, and you know, thinking back, when Jesus told them about these two healing stories, what did the people in Nazareth do? What did his hometown folks do? They wanted to stone him and throw him off the cliff. If you've ever been to Nazareth, you know it sits up on a cliff. They wanted to throw him down and kill him. That's how bad this story uh, impacted that crowd. So let's go to 1 Kings 17. And this is the prophet Elijah. And you know that when John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus who he was, people in, in, around, including John's disciples, thought Jesus might be who? Elijah, right? Are you Elijah? Who, who are you? Are you Moses? Are you Elijah? They wanted to know because what they saw Jesus doing preaching the good news that the kingdom had come and healing people, those were the very same things that Elijah and Moses had done. And so we find ourselves in chapter 
uh, 17 of First Kings. I'm going to back up and give you the, the preamble here, which I think will explain why Jesus used this particular story out of the Old Testament. So we, we go back to 1629. Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 22 years. Okay? But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. So how bad a dude was Ahab in the Lord's sight? He was the most evil of the evil kings. And as though it were not enough to follow the example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel. So Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians. Here we are in Sidon. And he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any other of the kings before him. So how much syncretism did Ahab engage in? Remember, we've talked syncretism before. The combination of Christianity and the culture, or the combination in this case of the Hebrew religion and the culture. How syncretic was Ahab? He was totally syncretic. So he was totally more evil than any of the other kings and he was sold out to the culture so much so that he was the worst of all the kings. And you know in the in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, we have bad king, bad king, bad king, one good king, four bad kings, and so on. So he's the worst of the bad kings. It was during his reign that Hiel, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid its foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son, Abiram. And when he completed it and set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son, Segub. So why, what's up with that? Why did two sons die for rebuilding Jericho? What's that? Don't rebuild this place. And so these guys are disobeying the commandment of the Lord and they lost their son you would think if one your oldest son died because you were doing something, you would what? Stop. You'd stop. These people are so infected with disobedience, disregard, lack of fear for the Lord that they will even let their own children die for the sake of what they want to do. Did it let him die or did he sacrifice them? It's not clear in the text, but... That's a good point. They may have been sacrificed to the to quote the gods to favor to favor the rebuilding. It's possible. The text is not clear. At least we know they were dead. Which is bad enough. It would be even worse if they were sacrificed. It might have been worse than their dad, so. So his oldest son and his youngest son are dead. What's happening to this dude's social security plan? Huh? It's not looking good because that was his security was in his progeny. This all happened according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho spoken by Joshua of Nun. So here we see Ahab, this wicked king, taking the Hebrew religion combining it with the culture up to and including sacrificing children. And for that, we see in the first part of 17 that the Lord brought a lack of rain for three and a half years to the area. So much so that Elijah uh, had to leave town and go to the brook, be fed by the ravens. And we pick up the story of Zarephath 
in 1 Kings 17, verse 8. Now, Zarephath is a prominent city on the coast. It was a Roman city in Jesus' time, and it was a trade route where trade went. Think about the Mediterranean. Goods flowed from the west, from the island of Crete, from Italy, from Greece, flowed into the eastern Mediterranean. Sidon and Tyre were commercial cities. Zarephath is right there. These goods flowed through the Holy Land, what we would call the Holy Land, from Sidon and Tyre. And they went through the town of Capernaum. Have you heard of that town? Or Capernaum, as some people say it. Another trade route to Damascus and beyond to the east. So Jesus is, is in Nazareth on the route between Zarephath and Capernaum where he also uh, hung out. That was Peter's home, Capernaum. So Zarephath is a trade route. Why would you want to be, why would you want to locate your corporate headquarters in a trading city? You could do more trades. So you could do more trade. Jackie? Advantage. It's an advantage, right? Location, uh, location, location, location. You know, are you going to choose to locate your company in Dallas, Texas, or I got to be careful here, uh, or McGee, Mississippi, a town I mentioned earlier? Okay, it's obvious you want to be in Dallas because there's more trade flowing in and out. Not much happening in McGee these days. So. When we think about uh, the exercise of spiritual gifts, our subject today, and the power of witness, if you have a witness in a place where a lot of people are flowing in and out, what's going to happen to that witness? It's going to spread very quickly. If you're in McGee, well, the Lord can do anything, okay? And it still could spread. But strategically, Elijah is sent during the midst of this uh, drought to Zarephath. So let's go starting in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So here's the first problem. Who is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of heaven's armies, who is he choosing to sustain the man of God? A widow. A widow, one of the weakest people in all of society. What'd you say? I just beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, okay. In those days, one of the weakest members of all society. Okay. Thank you for that. And secondly, she's not a Hebrew, right? She's a widow, a Gentile. You couldn't have picked a more startling person <laughs> to care for the man of God. It says she's facing starvation. Now. And she's facing starvation because this drought is over the region, right? And Sidon and Tyre are not far from northern Israel. Um, they're they're very close. She's not that old because it's a young son. She has a young son, so her husband died somehow. We don't know the the details. So he went to Zarephath. Notice he's going into this center of Sidonian religion. What would you do if God told you to move to Hollywood? To use a modern day example, I want you to go to Hollywood. Florida or California? <laughs> we'll, 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 and we know from some of the other prophets who were called, well, we'll, we'll, well Lord, I don't speak so good. And uh, 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 I'd be coming up with excuses, right? Elijah goes. He's called, he goes. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, quote, Would you pre please bring me a little water in a cup? Have we heard this? From someone else? Who? who? The woman at the well. Would you just give me a little bit of water? 
Well, sir, you're a Jew. Why are you asking me for water? So this is an, what we call an echo of Jesus. And this is why people thought Jesus might be Elijah. Come back from the dead. Would you please bring me a water and a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread in my house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. Then my son and I will die. So what condition is she in? She's totally destitute. She has no options. She's at the end of her rope or at the end of her flour and oil. And she's planning to cook their final meal. She may not be Hebrew, but she has a knowledge of God. Because she can swear by His Lord and follows the call thereof. That's a great catch. Okay, Why... How does she know about this Lord, your God? And why does she know that this guy, Elijah, is a man sent from God? He's trying to eat her food. He's sneaking up on her Thanksgiving feast. I asked first. Huh? (laughs) You asked first. (laughs) That'll teach you to come to this class. Uh, Jackie will answer for, for both of us. You said it was on a trade route this mm-hmm. time. And, mm-hmm. you know, miracles, word of mouth gets around you, maybe get her. E- Elijah was pretty famous, right? People knew who he was. His, his reputation preceded him. He was known as a prophet of God, a man of God, someone who spoke for God. And so somehow she recognized him. Um, the, the answer can always be, well, you know, the text isn't clear. <laughs> See how impressive that sounds? When you were, use the word text, you know, you just sound smarter than if you just say, I don't know. So I tell my students, I say, you know, a good answer is always, well, it depends. <laughs> so some of them will say, when I ask them a question, they go, it depends. I go, oh boy, I, I taught you that. So she knew who he was. Uh, And she swore by the Lord, not her God, not the Sidonian God, but his God, the Lord your God. But Elijah told her, fear not, in the King Jimmy version of this. Fear not. Who else says that? Every angel that gives a message. Every angel that gives a message. And who else like that word? Don't be afraid. Jesus, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Are we afraid? Are we worried about stuff? Are we worried? Are we fearful? Are we concerned about our families, about our community, about our culture, about our nation? Here we see Him say, the very words that Jesus used over and over again. In my translation, it says, Do not be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. What is he asking her to do? Feed him first. Feed him first. Now, she just said what she's doing is cooking her final meal. And then she and her son are going to die. What's he really asking her to do? To trust, have faith, and believe in the Lord his God. She's asking him, uh, she is, he is asking her to believe, have faith, and is this intellectual faith that we see here? What if someone came to you and all you had was this little bit and you were going to cook it for yourself and your son and then you were going to lay down and starve to death? Would you give your last measure of flour, part of it, 
to a stranger man of God? I don't know if I would. But her faith is so great. And this is why Jesus, I think, talked about her in His first sermon. His faith, her faith is so great that she ends up doing it. And Elijah says, picking back up in 14, For this is what the Lord God, the Lord, the God of Israel says, There will always be flour and olive left in your container until the time when the Lord send, sends rain and the crops grow again. Now she has a choice to make, right? She can throw the guy out. She can tell him to get lost, go find some food. Why are you bothering a widow who's about to die with her son? Or she can be obedient. But he told her before she acted on it that he would never if you do this, then God will honor this. And... Has the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of Heaven's armies, ever told me, if you're obedient and you do these things, then all will go well with you. If you honor your father and mother, all will go well with you. But I do what? I choose to do what? Even though I have the promise, right? You may not be listening. Well, let's assume I list, I'm listening. How many times have I not trusted? How many times have I been disobedient and not done what the man of God told me to do? In this case, Elijah. And so here we have a person who has every reason to be disobedient and to enjoy her last meal with herself and her son. And yet she chooses in verse 15, so she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers. She never had to go back to Kroger. <laughs> Just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. So she, was, she heard the promise. She had a choice to make to believe or not believe, to obey, not obey, and act or not act. She did it in the face of death. And then, when she did it, there was always enough, verse 16, flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he died. Then, he said to Eli then she said to Elijah, O oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? So for a moment, she thinks everything's getting better. They have enough food in the midst of this drought. And then what happens? The child dies. Now think about where this is. Where are we? We're in Sidon. What's a prominent feature of their religion? Child sacrifice. Right? <clears throat> so she's got a prophet of God there. Her son dies. She's naturally going to think what? I've done something to anger the gods. Your God. Whoever that God is. So she says, have you come here to kill my son? Which was happening all around. But Elijah replied, verse 19, quote, give me your son. <coughs> and he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times, 
and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. Now have we heard of someone stretching their body over a dead person before? In the New Testament? Did Paul do that in Acts for the, the in, young man that fell Indeed out of he did during the, the incident of the boring sermon. <laughs> the little guy is up, the little kid is up in a window, right? And there are some stories up, I think three stories up. Paul is preaching till dawn. The little boy falls out the window. He dies. Paul says, bring him to me. And they said, well, but he's dead. They brought him to a room. They, he laid on the boy. The boy came back to life. So what happened? 22. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. And this brings us to images of uh, that little boy in Paul's case. It brings us to images of Lazarus when Jesus said, come out. And he came out of the grave. Then the woman told Elijah, and this is the purpose of Jesus bringing this to the attention of his hometown folks and to us uh, for all eternity. Then the woman told Elijah, Now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. You see, in a syncretic culture where we're mixing true belief with the culture, it's hard to tell who's a true man of God and who God speaks through and who is a false teacher. And so this miracle was not for the widow's benefit, although she benefited. The miracle was so that she could proclaim there on that trading route that the God of Israel was the most powerful God. And then we go to the great contest on Mount Carmel, and we know Elijah defeated all the prophets of Baal in that incident uh, there. So I want to bring us back to uh, Nazareth um, and this text uh, where in Mark's version, I'm going to read you from, from Luke's version as we close. In Mark's version, the sending out of the disciples comes immediately after the Nazareth uh, sermon. So he sent, him, sent them out immediately after. In Luke's version, the recording of this incident is a little bit later in chapter 10. Uh, well, this is the sending out of the 72. So Jesus himself is healing, proclaiming the good news, preaching. He is healing and casting out demons. Those three things always go together. Jesus is proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God has come. He's healing and he's casting out demons. Looks a lot like Elijah. Looks a lot like Elisha and other prophets of God. So here in Luke, we're going from Jesus himself doing it to the twelve disciples doing it. And then in chapter 10 of Luke, he sends out the 72. And now the Lord chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. Quote, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. When, whenever you enter someone's home, first say, May God's peace be on this house. 
If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they're not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever they set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses, you, refuses to welcome you, go out into its streets and say, We wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show you we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? These were towns where Jesus did miracles. For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you people. And you people of Capernaum, will, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. That's a nice way of saying you will go to hell. 16, then he told the disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who is rejecting me is rejecting God who sent me. When the 72 return, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we use your name. And we find in Mark's rendition of this that Jesus um, says that if people don't believe, then what? Where they'll go. Hmm? Where they'll probably go. Well, they're going to go <laughs> down there, right? Just leave. Hmm? Just leave. You just leave. Because in the face of unbelief, can miracles happen? Miracles cannot happen in the face of unbelief. And so, the reason why Elijah was sent to Zarephath is conditions were so bad in Israel that God was not about to do a miracle, lift the, the drought, because why? They had a king who was the most wicked of all kings, who was bringing together the culture and the Hebrew faith. And the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of Heaven's armies, was not about to do a miracle in those places. And Jesus Himself said that in Capernaum, where He did many miracles, the people kept asking for what? Do some more. Prove it again. Prove it again. And so when we engage in unbelief and we engage the culture and try to blend the culture with our faith and we really don't believe, we believe in the gift of administration and the spiritual gift of leadership. Here's a list. I just took this from the United Methodist Church. This is a list. So, do we have gifted administrators in the church? Yes. Uh, do we have gifted uh, exhorters, preachers? Exhortation is preaching, yes. Do we have gifted givers, if that's a word, in the church? Uh, gifted healers. Seen any miracles lately? Had any testimony? Miracles? We have gifted physicians. I'm talking supernatural healing. Are we seeing it? Pardon? You did. Amen. Okay, you want to say more or not say more? Well, in 2015, I had, I had breast cancer. And before my treatment started, it was one Sunday after church. We were sitting at lunch. And my mother-in-law 
was sitting next to me. We were in nukes of all places, crazy, crowded. And she looked at me and she touched my leg and she said, the miracle is going to happen in you. When you have your surgery, there will be no cancer there. My when you have your surgery, what? There will be no cancer there. Oh. And I mean, my mother-in-law had three children who were physicians, but she's not medical at all. And I just thought she has no. 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 And I said, well, thanks, Kathy. That's the best way you say that. <laughs> and I had chemo, and when they did my mastectomies, there was no cancer there. Praise God. The medicine I feel that He gave me just the right medicines and just the right way. And, a, and someone with no medical her, training spoke a prophetic word. I asked her later, I said, did you know what you were saying? She said, I couldn't hold the words back. She said, I, I had to tell you that day, I could not hold the words back. And she touched you. And she touched me. Because we were, we were sitting at the table and I just happened to look to her. There was crazy going on and she just said it. And she was right. And there, friends in Christ, there you have a witness. There you have a witness. Because someone believed in the midst of the most unlikely place, Zarephath, Zarephath, right? The restaurant. Well, healing's supposed to occur at the Holy Ghost healing. Seen those sounds around town? Signs around town? I wanted to go there, quite frankly, but I, I was busy or something. But I wanted to see what was going to happen. So there in a place, the most unlikely place, the Holy Spirit spoke to your mother-in-law who loves you. She touched you and spoke a prophetic word into your life. And that's what we're talking about here. Is these miracles are in miracles are on this list. Prophecy, a miracle of healing occurred. And so I wonder uh, if we really think about our lives and, and we have all lived a long time, most of us in this room except for Josh, I wonder if we, well, and maybe a couple of you other young people, Sydney and Kristen, uh, if we look back in our lives, can we see the hand of God and miracles that may not have been evident at that moment, but looking back, we can see those miracles. And the purpose of the miracle is not just for us. And that's where the, the name it and claim it and the, you know, this crazy religion uh, is off base. The purpose of the miracle is te to testify that the God of heaven, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, came to bring healing to us so that we would be able to tell others this is not just intellectual. This is not just an academic subject. This is real. And our sister and brother uh, over there testified to a miracle in their life. Why? So that others might believe and the kingdom might be built up and others could experience the healing that all of us have experienced in one way or another. You see, people like the widow at Zarephath are looking for hope. Do we live in a society with increasing hopelessness? Do we live in a society that's increasingly coarse and ill-mannered? We saw that in our football games this weekend. <laughs> right? It's disgusting. And by testifying to these miracles that we have experienced, we give people hope and the real option, which is not the culture, it's Jesus Christ our Lord. Next week, we'll finish up by going... Go ahead. Randy, it's almost uh, like we're being instructed here to preach 
only to the choir. Mm -hmm. So, at what point does this refusal, uh, you know, what form does it take? Remember, the widow at Zarephath was not in the choir. Right? The, the, she wanted to be in the choir, and, the, and that's a great question. I'll get into it more next week when we, close, when we finish. Non-believers look at us, particularly when it's only the preacher or the Sunday school teacher, and when we fall, when we fall into sexual sin, for example, they say, look at, look at that preacher. They're hypocrites. All of them are hypocrites. That's why I don't believe those people are hypocrites. Have we not heard that? Who can refute this testimony over here, particularly coming from a medical doctor? Who can refute this? And the non... Pardon? Non-believers refute it. Well, there's a difference between refute or refuse. Well, their hearts can be hardened, but they've heard it, right, if it comes from these two saints. There's even more to that story. The morning she got diagnosed, I woke up at four and had to start praying as hard as I could. I don't know what woke me up. She didn't tell me she felt a note. She didn't tell me she felt anything. She went that morning and I woke up and I said, I just got to pray. When my father shut the door and prayed as hard as I'd ever prayed. Mm. And her nurse called me at about eight or nine. I was at work and they said, you need to call. Mm. Call her right now. Mm. And I didn't know what in the world. And she said, I wasn't going to tell you, but that morning she walked into the hospital. Wasn't going to do really anything and passed her to that morning mm. by the radiology suite where they're doing mammograms and said she just got pushed into the mammogram suite. And she's, you know, hey, we got it. She was the first lady up there because nobody was there. She said, well, there's nobody here. The person's not here. Step up, we'll do this mammogram. The tech, they saw something a little bit, but the techs are, they can't say a word. So that brought out and said, oh, there may be something. They get the tech down. The tech happened to be there at 7 in the morning. The tech can't say anything, so she got an ultrasound. But if she says anything, you know, the doctor would get mad. So all she could do, she saw from the first crime. That's all she, she couldn't say anything. So then the enrolls the radiologist and, and does all that. They caught it, you know, just like that. She wasn't going to tell me. So I woke up that morning. And even deeper part is a, two months later, I had a dream about it. That she was bald, that we were sitting at a basketball game. And then I was pulling white stuff, and you know, from my stuff, we were pulling a white trach out of her neck. And that disturbed me so bad, I got up and wrote it down. I was like, what in the world was that? Why is that so difficult? And at the very end of all the stuff that she went through after, after that, the doctor wasn't there. Dr. Lay wasn't available to pull the drains out, so I had to pull both drains out, and it was exactly what I saw. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, the basketball game, she had to come with all her drains in because I got, I couldn't make it, and she had to take my son to a basketball game. Oh, wow. Every single part of it. I, I wrote it down because I just, this is mm -hmm. too much. And so the witness is, back to, to your observation and question, the witness as beautiful and wonderful as it is, and you heard my story a couple weeks ago, as wonderful as it is for me, it's not for me. It's for the glory of God and for those who don't believe, who are looking for hope. And they have a chance when they hear these stories, they are confronted, and sorry we're over time, but they hear these stories and the Lord puts before them the eternal and essential question of life that the widow of Zarephath was confronted in with. Are you going to believe or not? And it's not the preacher, it's not some hyper-educated person, although y'all are hyper-educated. It's a person of faith who's telling their story and that story, in order for it to be denied, your heart has to be really hard. And if you hear the good news over and over again, these witnesses, 
your heart has to be really hard not to at some point to surrender to the Holy Spirit. And that's where witness is so important externally. And that's why I share my witness, uh, my, my story with students at, at school. Because many of them have friends or themselves that have the same problem that I had. And they can't believe it. It's unbelievable. It's so interesting that God chose that poor widow. Why, you know, it's like, you know, in our minds, we just said, oh, you know, choose a merchant or somebody that has lots of influence and all this business. But He chose that widow. Mm-hmm. And, did, and all this came to pass for her salvation. And for her to tell others, because yes. they're people were probably asking her, "Hun, I thought you were going to lay down and die, yeah. but we seen you in the marketplace. What happened? You won't believe it. You won't believe it. You won't believe it." Do you know it was interesting to me that he provided until the drought was over. Mm-hmm. In yeah. other words, the whole time yeah. he complete. Salvation physically till the drought was over. And I said uh, a couple of weeks ago when I shared my story after that, you know, we went over like we're going over today. How many of y'all left here saying, I didn't like that story? (laughs) Well, I didn't care for that preacher's sermon. You know, (laughs) not that you have ever said that or me. Or I can't believe he went over today. I'm going to be late for the Piccadilly. Okay. Or how many of you, as you listen to this beautiful witness, were going and, and wanted to get up and walk out? Did anybody want to get up and walk out? Have you ever gotten up and walked out of church before? No, no comment. Okay. I'm guilty, right? This is the power and the beauty of witness we want to hear, if we hear these, and I use the word stories, they're not stories, they're testimonies. And they're not for us, they're for the lost and hurting world. Well, I was and a if, tough nut to crack because I didn't become a Christian until I was not 49. Hmm. Amen. I, I heard it over uh, with... Uh, What's the man up in, I've forgotten his name up in uh, Virginia Beach. Robertson. That's right. He heard it over and over and over again. You, it oh, just, yeah, just I, took I, a while. This girl came and gave her mm-hmm. witness. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. Yep. And that's why we should never stop witnessing. Let, let's pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the beautiful story of the widow and Zarephath and your ministry to her through Elijah. We thank you for Jep and Karen's uh, testimony today of your power uh, and your healing. And Lord, while we're so grateful uh, for the healing that they experienced in, in Karen's life, we ask that you would use their story and each of our stories to let the dark and hurting world and people that we love and people that we know. Uh, Let them understand that this faith that we believe is not just something that is an intellectual exercise or something we do on Sunday. It's real. And it is where we find hope, we find abundant life, and we find the ultimate truth, which is found in only in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. As we go from here, We pray that you would give us a restful Sabbath. Help us to be faithful witnesses of your truth and to live in the power of the Spirit uh, that you have given us. We pray most humbly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.